For years, mankind has invented a number of supposed cure-alls designed to solve practically every affliction imaginable. Snake oils and soda companies originally made a name for themselves by marketing their sugar-laden products as medicine. However, in the past year or so, a new treatment has emerged that actually does what others came before it could not. CBD. There are plenty of places you can pick up CBD in various forms, but it can be a bit of a pain to find exactly what you're looking for. As a result, I was pretty amped when I was introduced to CBD.com, which is basically a one-stop shop for all of your CBD needs. There are countless ways to consume CBD, and whether you're looking for a topical, CBD-infused beverage, some gummies or tinctures, this website has virtually everything you can imagine. CBD.com is basically the Amazon of CBD. They've taken extra precautions to make sure all the products on the website meet federal guidelines, and they've teamed up with laboratories that give everything they sell a seal of approval. I've purchased my fair share of CBD products since it became a thing, but I haven't found a place that makes buying it as painless as CBD.com does. So whether you're a CBD veteran or a newcomer, check out CBD.com for all your CBD needs. That's spelled C-B-D-E-E.com. And now, back to Oh Yeah, Oh Yeah, The Entourage Podcast. <laughs> No reviews. What are you worried about, Johnny? I don't know. I felt good about the show and all. But now that it's actually airing... The show is great, Jeremy. Just relax. It really is drama. This is coming from someone who's never liked your work. Hello and welcome back to Oh Yeah, Oh Yeah, the Entourage podcast. I am your host, J.R. Hitty. Hope everybody had a great weekend. Thanksgiving week for all my listeners in the United States. Hope everybody's winding down for the year and settling in for another episode of the acclaimed Entourage podcast. I don't know why I just called it the acclaimed. I don't know who's acclaimed it uh, <laughs> besides the few people that listen. But uh, great episode this week, guys. We broke down season 3B, episode 6, The Resurrection. My guest this week was John Cullen. He's a comedian based out of Canada. Super funny guy. He's the co-host of Blot Party, which is like a top 50 podcast in the world. He has a new metal podcast coming out. He tours all over Canada. We went deep on this episode because this is an interesting one. In this episode, pretty much everything is set for the next two seasons of the show. The boys finally did the Median script they've wanted. Johnny Drama finally makes it as a TV star. So we had a lot of fun. Went a little bit longer this week, but it was an interesting conversation throughout. If you guys haven't yet, followed the social media accounts oh yeah pod on instagram and twitter please 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 leave me a five-star review as a christmas present if you're feeling generous and don't forget to listen to the spotify playlist that's in the show notes of today's episode so without further ado let's dive into season 3b episode 6 the resurrection all right my guest this week is a stand-up comedian and podcaster his podcast blot party regularly hits the top 50 on the itunes podcast charts he's appeared on television as part of the just for Laughs, Winnipeg, and Halifax Comedy Festivals. Dialing in from Vancouver, Canada, John Tallinn, welcome to the Entourage Podcast. Oh man, thank you for having me, JR, and thank you for such a nice introduction. You know, not everyone gets it so sharp, so that was really good. Thank you. I've made it a point to really, like, gas up my desks because it's important to talk, like, about your highlights because that's what this show is. Entourage is just, it's just highlights of it's someone's one life. Big, one big highlight, and that is how <laughs> I feel about my life, too, is just one big highlight. When people ask yeah. me how I'm doing, I'm like, I'm amazing. I'm doing so good. I never think about the times I've been hurt or have screwed no, up, ever. <laughs> absolutely not. And this, and if you took a video of my apartment right now, it would look very similar to the houses you see on Entourage. Correct. As everyone knows, once you perform at the Winnipeg Comedy Festival, <laughs> you get that mansion, JR. Yes, sir. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit before we dive into this week's episode, Season 3B, Episode 6, The Resurrection. What was your relationship with Entourage like? When did you first start watching it? Did you watch it all the way through? Did you, did you watch it through the movie? Uh, yes, uh, I watched it through the movie, which I don't know how much you talk about the movie on this show, but I still, I'm still waiting for it to end. I'll say yeah. that, JR. No one, it was, I have never seen a movie where I'm watching it 
and it ends and you're like oh did they just run out of money and that's why it just had to end there like they just decided like oh there was another 15 minutes in the script but ronda rousey demanded an extra three million and we couldn't finish it or something i don't know it's very confusing but i have seen it and i've seen all the episodes and I, as far as remember like it's interesting to think about when i came to the show i want to say that it was it wasn't in the first season. I want to say it was the second season because I feel like I remember going back and watching the first season. And two thousand and five. Yep, two thousand five. And this was. Uh, it's funny you have a question about bros being bros because this was <laughs> me, uh, me and a uh, my best buddy at the time, and he's still still a very good friend of mine. We we went to high school together, and then we went to university together. So this would have been airing like right around when I was in first second year university we we watched the show together so it 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 became a thing where we would uh because we i live in canada so hbo getting hbo up here is not that easy it's a lot easier now but back then oh, interesting. Yeah. it was difficult to get hbo so what we did was we would actually wait until the dvds came out and then one of us would buy the dvd set and then we would just get together and we would binge it all in like one night or two nights maybe yeah, just that like is so get, cool. Just get pizza. We'd watch yeah. it, and like I can specifically remember. I want to say season five. It had a red cover, I think, and that yep. was the one we were like most looking forward to. to uh, for whatever, I don't. I to this, I couldn't tell you what was happening and why we wanted it so bad. But I remember that especially being one where we were just like jacked, like Friday night have a few drinks, order a pizza, and just watch eight episodes of Entourage with my bro. That's incredible. Incredible. Yeah. No, that, I mean, that is just a universal bros being bros. You just don't have that anymore, man. Like, True. with streaming and, you know, if me and you wanted to sit down and watch Entourage on a Saturday, I would have already watched half of it because I have it, like, on my phone or... Totally. It was just that moment, too, of, like, the the actual, like, going to a store and buying something, you know, and the anticipation of that. Like, I think this generation misses out on that like mu- music was like that too you know you'd wait like and I mean I'm dating myself again but I can specifically remember the only I was a goody goody in high school the only time I ever skipped class was when Linkin Park's Meteora <laughs> came out <laughs> and you're not me- dating yourself man that's that's my it's right in my age group too don't worry <laughs> I'm surprised I'm actually not dating myself and I have a girlfriend because it's a miracle I escaped this <laughs> but uh but yeah Lincoln Parks Meteora me and a buddy because I live grew up in a small town and the closest record store was 30 minutes away so we actually skipped class drove to the record store to buy Meteora and then like listened to it all the way back to school and we were just like this is the best album that's ever been released like it was just insane so it's like you miss that you miss that moment of like going to the store buying a thing you, you can't wait to get home and yeah. open it it was yeah awesome but with entourage but with wow. entourage yeah yeah <laughs> exactly. all the shit i did it with is uh is you know maybe yeah dating myself and slightly embarrassing but uh yeah. you take what you can get you know we have a couple 22 year old guys listening to this being like those poor bastards that sounds horrible <laughs> if you're a 22 year old listening to an entourage podcast i think you got bigger problems than what we're talking about hey, I'm, I'm not i'm not saying anyone has any problems but <laughs> Watch, yeah, watch some more up-to-date shows. Um, <laughs> and, John, yeah. before we dive into uh, what happened during this uh, time period, I just wanted to welcome you as the first foreign guest that we've had on oh. the uh, Entourage podcast. Thank you. I didn't know <laughs> Canada are. was so foreign. So foreign, man. <laughs> I, uh, thank you. I, I accept. That's wonderful. It's Beautiful. great to be your first Canadian. So you've only had Americans on. Only Americans, yeah. I think wow. I think that's the case. It's been 40-some episodes. I'm trying to think of... No, I think I think that's the case. Um, and you you always have a guest on. Every week it's me yeah. and a guest. I tried right. episode two. I was uh, initially, and this is peeling back the curtain a little bit. Initially, it was going to be I was going to have a guest every other week. Episode two, I did it solo. And while I would think I'm a decent podcaster, it just didn't resonate as well. <laughs> so. That's fair. That's a nice way of saying it. I like yep. that. It didn't Let's resonate. Just, just put it that way. <laughs> yeah. No, I, it's, it, it is a, I mean, you're a comedian, so you know, like we, we do our job, we talk for 40 to 60 minutes straight or whatever, but there is something different about just, okay, I'm going to sit down in a room in my house in front of a microphone yeah. and go off for an hour about this thing. And with this show specifically, it's so much better talked about socially. It's so much better remembering your favorite moments and, you know, giving theories and opinions. It just, it makes for a much better show. So I decided to dive in. Are you ready? I'm ready. Let's do it. All right. So this episode 
Episode 6 of Season 3B, The Resurrection, it aired on Sunday, May 13th, 2007. On this date, you played hockey, you're a hockey guy. You were a hockey reporter at one point? Uh, I was, yeah. So the gold medal game of the 2007 IIHF World Championship was held in Moscow, Russia. It was the 71st annual World Championship event. It was run by the International Ice Hockey Federation, hence IIHF. Do you know who won that tournament? Oh boy! I mean, prob- I mean, I guess Canada. Is that why you're bringing it up? Correct. Hell yeah! The tournament was won. Who was the most valuable player at that time? Oh boy! 2007. I'm gonna say. I'm gonna say Rick Nash. Dane, Dane, Dane. Holy shit! Nailed it. Nice. Yeah, that was his like uh, breakout because he was a first overall pick of the Columbus Blue Jackets, and I want to say 2000 two maybe maybe a little after and people thought he was going to be like a great player in the nhl and he was very good but he hadn't quite been great and then in that tournament with that was like his coming out party where it was like oh shit this guy means business and then he played very he played it for canada in many major tournaments after that i think solely because of his performance in that tournament yeah, Canada won 4-2 to two versus Finland. They went up 3-0 on power play goals by the tournament MVP Rick Nash and Eric Stahl and an equal strength goal by Colby Armstrong. Oh, wow. The Finland team mounted a comeback attempt in the third, but it ended in an empty net clincher by Nash. I had a feeling you'd know that, but to me this just seems like the most obscure like <laughs> hockey trivia on the fucking planet. Uh, yeah, all your listeners are asleep now. They're like, this is, <laughs> we told JR never have a Canadian on the show. This is absurd. <laughs> it's the same thing on Blocked Party. Like, we have a lot of American listeners and so yeah. we had one episode where, uh, like, we, we do a, a listener mailbag for our bonus episodes sometimes, so listeners sure. can send in questions and someone asked uh, what the most cursed Canadian airport is and uh, I, as a comedian and a curler i have been to basically every small town west of Mini- uh, west of manitoba so it like people there are americans who are writing in after being like when you were talking about that like i felt like i was in an alternate dimension like i didn't yeah. understand the words you were saying i didn't know what was happening like it was just crazy Fair enough. We do have listeners internationally, so the UK, Australia. Shout out to all those listeners. And every once in a while, I'll have a guest on from like Southern California, and I live in Northern California, and we'll spend a pretty decent amount of time on the podcast just like talking about highways and like towns and <laughs> sure, stuff. And like, sure. Ooh, we're really alienating ourselves here. Yeah, but. yeah. Hey, can I, JR, can I just send a shout out to your Australian listeners? Uh, good day. Yeah. <laughs> That's for your Australian listeners. I don't think they, under- they wouldn't have understood it if I said something. Yeah, different. that's a good point. Thank okay, you. quickly to recap this week's episode. Um, Five Towns is about to debut, and Drama is doing everything he can to avoid seeing any reviews of his new series. To relieve his tension, he hits an Asian massage parlor, in quotes, but ends up reading a review of his performance anyways, where he sees that he's been universally panned. Ari sets up a meeting with super producer Joe Roberts to try to sell him on financing Medellin. Roberts agrees to make Medellin happen, but he has one condition. Vince must agree to finally appear in Matterhorn. Vince refuses to do Matterhorn, and he and E hatch a new plan, to buy Medellin and make the film themselves. Rather than enter a bidding war, Roberts bats out of Medellin, allowing Vince and E to acquire the script for $5 million. As a consolation diff for drama, the crew fixes up his car, and while picking up the ride, Turtle falls for Telly, the daughter of Rufus, the repair shop's owner, and the female version of himself. Drama hops in the car and drives off into the night, ending up at the Grand Canyon. The next morning, he finally decides to answer Vince's call and is shocked to hear that Five Towns drew 16 million viewers to become a certified hit. Johnny Drama is finally a star. John, what was your favorite moment from this week's episode? Oh, boy. I, uh, okay. This this was I think we we've, we've talked about uh like coming back to entertainment that you've liked in a in the past is an interesting thing because I think you remember like if someone asked me to describe Entourage I would remember all the cameos I would remember how it was like yeah the store Mark Wahlberg story whatever I'd remember those kind of things but I think you you end up forgetting some of the important things and yep. one of the things i forgot about was um all the high fives 
<laughs> yes. <laughs> Those they they high fived so many times. It was a crazy number of high fives. Like, like and, platonic and I, male high fives just, in like it's <laughs> just every just all the every time anything happened. That was like the that's like the way they cue the end of a scene. They're like, oh Vince and E high five. Like that's the action brackets. There was yep. so much high fiving in this shit. Like I was that's so, so it, it there was so much high fiving that I thought to myself did I high five a lot? Like I was like, <laughs> yeah, I was like, I must have, you know, maybe I did high five a lot when I was that age. I don't know, but it just, that was something I didn't remember. And I was like, this is cool. Like it's not, but like, it's cool though. Also like, yeah. it was a lot of like the, you know, they did the, like the, like clap and then the, like, pfft, the like pull apart snap thing. Yep. Oh man. There was a ton of that. And it was just like, fuck yeah, we did this thing at a, ah, blah, yeah. And I was like, cool. So that was those are my favorite moments. <laughs> those are perfect, dude. I love it. There's the moment when like Vince finds out that they got the script and he's just like gets off the phone quietly and he's just like, we got it. And they just Hey Vince. Ari, I didn't totally follow that. The movie is yours. You got it for five million dollars. The studio is into it for more than twice that amount, but they're gonna settle, all right? Congratulations. You're the proud owner of 150 pieces of paper. Yeah, Daddy. Thank you, Ari. So what's next? Next, you come in and you sign those agency papers, right, big boy? Yes, right, Ari. And then we go figure out where to get the other 70 or so million dollars to make this movie. Yeah, it's gonna be easy. <laughs> I don't doubt it, Vinny. Good night. We got it. Congrats, buddy. And they high five. It's yeah. infectious, man. And then they're like, man, where's drama right now to share in this high five? Like, Yeah, they want a high five drama so bad. They're like, shit, our bro's gone. It's only three <laughs> high fives instead of four. Or I guess two instead of three. Because you can't don't you don't high five yourself. Yeah. So yeah, that was my that was my favorite moment of the episode, was all the high fives. I love it. No, that's that's fantastic. I think so I have a drama moment and an Ari moment, which also like kind of step on the drama in Ari categories, but they just are really I, here, here's my favorite like overall kind of arc so Ari's on the phone with Joe Roberts he gets mad when he finds out that Joe Roberts is going to bid on Medellin and he gets pissed he hangs up he punches the screen and he's like fuck her and then he storms out of his office and you can see the wheels turning because he's trying to figure out how he can sell this to Vincent E and then the very next scene is him like strutting into Vince's house and being like, am I a miracle worker or what? And he's trying to sell it to them. And they're just like, no, Ari, you're not. This sucks. We're not doing that fucking movie. They just shoot him down so quickly. Joe. Fucker. Where are you going, Ari? Vince's. Making a house call? Yep. Ooh, something is afoot. What's up, Ari? Where's Vince? I want to tell you both the news. Right here, Ari. Better be good news. Do I ever give you anything but? Who wants to make Medellin? Are you serious? Not only that, but I have this. What's that? I am so good, not only did I get you your passion project, but I got you your next big hit, too. Matterhorn? Matterhorn. Boom! Am I a fucking magician or what? Yeah, you made a shitty project reappear? Shitty? No. This is a good project. We were never into it. And it really made me, like, kind of have some more respect for Ari. I'm like, damn, dude. Like, you are, you really are working your ass off to get your client what he needs. He was greased at it. You know what I really liked about that scene, too, is that the, <laughs> the front page of the Matterhorn script has a mountain on it. It does. <laughs> Which is like, that doesn't, they don't do that. Like, no, no. no script writer is like, I just want everyone to be sure that they know that this script I've named Matterhorn is about a mountain. I better put a <laughs> clip art picture of a mountain on the front of this script so that these guys know, hey, we're about to climb this fucking thing. And you, you can't even believe it. I just saw Ford vs. Ferrari this weekend. Could okay. you imagine if on the front of Ford vs. Ferrari there was like a picture of a race car or like yeah. a road? It was two car it was a Ford and a Ferrari hit crashing against each other in the <laughs> on the front page. Yeah, that was really funny. But yeah, I agree. I, like we'll get to the Ari mo I'll talk about Ari later when we get to that. But yeah, that was a good uh, I agree. I like that part. And then it's a little moment. I would say it's the funniest moment to me because I just love everything the drama does, but when he's storming into Variety and he's um, trying to find Paul Schneider, 
he jukes out the assistant. Where are you, Paul Schneider? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm Paul's assistant. Is there something I can help you with? Oh, that's okay, I'll help myself. <laughs> Schneider! That was it. I tried to stop him. I'm sorry. It's all right, Ryan. Sonny Chase. Looks like you read the paper. Does an up and under move, and it was really impressive. I'm like, Kevin Dillon is in his early 40s <laughs> making yeah. moves like that. And I was... I, it, it made me laugh out loud upon the rewatch. I think it's, it is it is funny, too, because I think if you did that in real life, it would totally work. Like, yeah. no, like no adult thinks that... You're, like, even if someone's trying to block you from somewhere, unless it's like a security guard situation where that's yeah, their whole exactly. job. If it's just like a regular dude who's like puts his arms out and is like, no, you can't come in here. If you just duck under their like you're for sure getting th- past them. Yeah. And most people in an office setting are like moving at half speed, regardless of what for it sure. is. If someone sure. was storming into my office, I'd just be like, hey, I'm going to step in front of you, but I'm not going to do much else. Like, you can go around. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. This guy's like, I'm not going to get hurt over this. I care a little bit, but not that much. Yeah. Every week, John, we talked about bros being bros moments. And, and it's not really the definition that you think. It's more of just like those moments of male camaraderie. Now, you kind of nailed it with the high five, but did you have bros being bros moments I on did. top of that? I had Let's another one because this, this show's really funny, and you, uh, you especially – notice it on a rewatch where you're like an adult man like I was like a teenage man when I watch it but it is very funny in that this show is like is bro it's like they're trying to be this almost like stereotypical idea of like masculine energy and yep. so I really liked the beginning of the show when drama's like sleeping in um and so they're going to like make breakfast or whatever and then you know, that both Vince and E burn Turtle because Turtle's like, oh, do you want me to cook breakfast? And yeah. they're like, I'm not that hungry. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then Vince is like, whatever, guys. Johnny's show's debuting today. He's earned a sleep in. Let's just sit around the table and enjoy each other's company. And then they <laughs> sit around the table and they don't talk. Yeah, that's like, it. I, I think he even says we should like, let's sit around the table and just talk about what's going on or something like yeah. that. And then they just sit around the table in silence. Yeah, I'm hungry. Me too. Should I try to make us something? Not that hungry. Pajamas gotta be down soon, right? Got to be. Did you call about his car? Be good as new by noon. Kid's gonna freak. Totally. What are we eating? That's a good question. Well, where's drama? <laughs> Another good question. Sleeping, probably. Really? Wow. Well, it's his big day. If he wants to sleep late, he should be able to sleep late. I know. I'm hungry. Oh, you want me to make you something to eat? I ain't that hungry, Terry. <laughs> all right, guys, let's not all panic. He'll be down soon, so let's sit. We'll talk. Wait it out together. Sorry I overslept, fellas. Who's hungry? And I was like, I feel that. I feel that energy of just like, these are like your three best friends. And sometimes that's all, you, like I like I said, me and my buddy who would watch Entourage. It's not like we talked, you know? Yeah. We'd get Entourage, we'd throw it on. We would hang out and not talk for like three hours. And to, But to guys, that's quality time. Especially you live with your three best friends. They don't need to talk that often. <laughs> no, exactly. So I love that. To me, that was a very, like, it was. it's under the radar. Because I think if you, yeah, like you said, if you thought of bros being bros, you'd think of high fives and stuff like that. But to me, that was like... We're true bros. Yeah. And it's, you know, we'll talk about how this episode would be different today, but if that was today, they'd just all be on their phones. They wouldn't be even, like, looking up at each other. (laughs) Exactly. Be like, oh, shit, okay, whatever. I'll hit Twitter for, like, an hour while you guys are doing this. Definitely. While we wait for Johnny. Yeah, my my bros being bros is just the whole plot of them, like, fixing up his car. Like, the, the LinkedIn Continental that, like, he's referred to in the past. He literally, in last week's episode, when they're at the horse track, he's, like, talking about how he won the money for the LinkedIn on a horse back in, like, the, you know, whatever, 90s or whatever it was. So, just them fixing it up, him getting all emotional over it. He's like, I can't believe you guys did this. It's really a symbol of, like, male, like, uh, caring. That they, like, fixed up something that had meant so much to him, like, sentimentally. Like... Girls, you know, take each other out. I'm not trying to get into a girls versus guy thing here, actually. I don't want to I don't want to go down that fucking road. But like it just it was a very masculine, like, feel good thing, which I I liked. Yeah, no, I, I thought that was good too for sure. I mean, I haven't rewatched any of the other episodes, so I didn't yeah. really it was funny, like you try and jog your memory, but the thing with the car just 
I know it's in the theme song, so I was like, "Oh, that's the car from the theme song." That's about all. That's about it. I don't know. The car has really... technically been in every episode. Of yeah, <laughs> exactly. And then <laughs> finally, and it's like the "How I Met Your Mother" of HBO shows. It's like yep. they introduced it in the very beginning of episode one, but you don't get to see it until episode forty or whatever. This it's is. it's true. What was your least favorite moment this week? I know that. You know, you said that on this show, you don't like to talk about things aging too poorly. Eh, so, we can talk about it a little but bit. But this yeah. is, to me, this is my my least favorite is, uh, well, obvi- like the whole rub and tug side plot is yeah. horrible. Yeah. And it's the, in particular, there's one line where uh, Johnny uh, is leaving Ari's off. So he's decided that he needs to relieve some of his pent up energy so he's gonna go to a rub and tug you want to hit a rub and tug now yeah i gotta shed some nerves i think i gotta wait for vince and e no you do that johnny is leaving the office and he says to this woman who's just standing there we only see like her side profile honey do you mind calling me cat please thank you and then she turns to the camera and she is impossibly attractive yeah, well like of course. it's like <laughs> it's like the idea of just like like maybe she's supposed to be a model or something, but I don't know. Like it seems like she's just supposed to be someone who works there, but she is like a 10 out of 10, like unbelievably attractive woman. And Johnny just compl- is like, it's so funny how at a lot of other times in the show, whenever hot women are around, the four of them are just like gaga, like, oh mm-hmm. my God, you know? And this is like probably one of the hottest women that's ever been shown on this show. But because she's in Ari's office, she's just some like slave that Johnny yeah. barely looks at and is like, call me a cab, honey. Like whatever. Like I would be like, if I was in Johnny's position, I'd be like, oh, well, I don't need to go to a rub and tug anymore. Like what's going on? Let me talk <laughs> to this girl. Like, so, but yeah, I mean, just the whole, that whole side plot and, and just, yeah, the like d- derisive, like, call me a cab, honey. Like that was my least favorite. The intention behind that is, doesn't come from a great place. Yeah. She's wearing like a, like a blazer and is on the phone. She's very clearly like at least an agent or like a junior agent or even a junior agent's assistant. That's not her role. Like to yeah. call him a cab. Now I have worked in offices before where like, this is before Uber, like the front desk girl, you could ask her, Hey, how do I call a tab? And she goes, Oh, I can call a tab for you. Oh, here's the phone number. But like, him just, you're right, walking out and kind of demanding that someone calls him a tab. Maybe not great. And doesn't uh, check with her to see if she's done it either. You know, it's yeah. just that classic, like, as he's walking, like, call me a cab, honey. And then with the next scene, it just flashes to him walking outside and the cab's pulling up. Like, I would be like, oh, I would probably, like, wait there, say hi. Be sure. like, oh, thank you for calling me a cab so much. She'd be like, oh, it's 10 minutes. You'd, like, wait there for a little. Like, it's just that kind of flip- well, flippancy is very jarring. Well, and it, it doesn't show. If you call a cab in L.A., it's like 25 minutes. So there's 25 minutes where drama's just standing in the lobby. Where, like, where was that? That would have been funny to see, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, with this woman he's called Honey. I think p- most people will agree with me on this. I'm not the biggest fan of Kelly, Rufus's daughter. In terms of, like, the role she plays on the show and then how she is as a character, she's kind of poorly written and executed. She's basically Turtle's fantasy girl, and she's just, like, sitting there almost, like, waiting for him. It's, like, a little too convenient that she knows everything about shoes, everything about everything, and she's, like, impossibly hot, and she's right there. Because you've never seen Turtle have any luck with women. He starts to over the next couple seasons, but this was the most out of left field to me. It was, it felt to me, John, like they were like, we gotta write Turtle a love story real quick here, and then they kind of shoehorn it in in these last two episodes, two, three episodes of season three. What do you think of these? Yeah, those are pretty cool, but they're not as cool as the Fearless Warriors, and those were the best Air Force Ones ever made. Yeah, that was a fly shoe, but I like the self-doubt color way better. Well, actually, I'll tell you it was better than both of them. The original cartoons? Yeah. Those were hats. Oh, well, I just happen to know that cartoons got new limiters dropping next summer. January, actually, and they'll be called the Cartoon New Year. <laughs> you know, you're, you're very pretty. You're just sadly very misinformed. <laughs> bet on it. Come on. I don't bet with girls. Hmm, chicken shit. Turtle, the fucking car is done. Now go and get it, and then go. I'm going, I'm going. Yeah, it was funny to that was the probably my second least favorite line when Turtle's like, Yeah, she's like me, but with tits. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think that was supposed to gross them out at the time too. Of I, course. So I don't think True, true, but I, I I reserve my right to not like it, JR. 
<laughs> yeah, one hundred percent. You, yeah, no, one hundred percent do. You're right. It it is definitely a weird because because yeah, they turtle is sort of has been played before this as like detestable. Like women think he's like he's like ugly and he's just like Vince's lackey, and he that's the only way he gets girls is by being yeah. like, hey, you want to see where Vince eats breakfast? Or yeah. like he's seen as this like lowly piece of shit, and now all of a sudden, yeah, some like insanely hot girl who apparently also has all of his interests is just like, oh yeah, this guy. <laughs> kicks ass i love this guy you know you're right it is like a very harsh it's a very harsh turn for for like the turtle character where we're supposed to believe and then of course he like ends up later on with like jamie lynn siegler and you're like okay like whatever well i mean that's entourage for you man like and that but that's the thing like I almost feel that the at least the Jamie Lynn plot was like fleshed out. There was some real romance in real life, which made the acting a little bit better, in my opinion. This was just like, let's throw an actress in here, and I'll, I'll talk about the actress a little bit later. But um, yeah, n- not a fan. <laughs> Hey guys, I wanted to quickly talk to you about CBD.com. One of the biggest problems I've come across when trying to track down CBD is that the industry is largely unregulated, and as a result, you never really know what you're going to get. As a result, CBD.com, which is basically the Amazon of CBD, has taken extra precautions to make sure all of the products meet federal guidelines. This means the only anxiety you'll have to deal with is the existential dread you wake up with every morning. And good news, CBD can help take care of that too. So check out the products at CBD.com. That's spelled C-B-D-E-E dot com. And now, back to Oh Yeah, Oh Yeah, The Entourage Podcast. Great lines and quotes in this week's episode, though. Dude. A lot of them are Johnny Drama quotes, but start yes. me off on some of yours. Uh, okay. I got a bunch, too. All right. I, I just have one, actually. So I, oh, great. I, I have a drama one that I love, but that's in my drama moment. Uh, put a pin in it till we'll then. Put a, we'll, put a, <laughs> we'll put a pin in it. But this, okay, now this is just unbelievable. Uh, Because I'm going to talk about this at the end of the episode, but like, obviously, I know that Entourage is a wish fulfillment show. Sure. It's like the idea that like all these, this is basically four guys who's, who have not just three wishes, they've got a hundred wishes and they get granted all the time, but it's like (laughs) remarkable when you haven't watched in a long time to see just how, and maybe this is a bad episode for this, JR, because I haven't been rewatching it like you, but mm-hmm. like literally within this 29 minutes, every character has a wish come true in, <laughs> in the episode. That's so right? true, dude. Like Vin, Vince and E get the Medellin script. Yeah. Turtle gets the girl finally. Johnny's on a hit show. It's like every everything's been leading up to this. And so it's just the line that really got me is Vince is sitting in the in the bar with Joe Roberts and E and Ari and they're having lunch. And this is how he convinces Joe to do Medellin. This is the line. Uh, well, first of all, E says... We think it could be like Scarface, Joe. Scarface was a bomb at the box office. Scarface was ahead of its time. Medellin isn't. Medellin is now. Joe, think about it. Pablo Escobar was an outlaw who terrorized a whole country while remaining the biggest philanthropist his people had ever known. And ask yourself this. In 2007, in this country, what could possibly evoke more of a stir than to explore the humanity of that kind of evil? And then Joe immediately is like, wow, you really want this, don't you, Vince? Yeah. <laughs> and it's two, it's two lines yep. that make almost no sense. I was about to say it doesn't track very well. <laughs> it doesn't make sense. Like, I don't understand how him also being a philanthropist, like, makes him more evil. Like, I think that's, like, kind of the point he's trying to make, but it doesn't make any sense. Like, it's just a very weird line and like they show in the middle of that like they panned Ari and Ari's just looking at Vince with his mouth open like wow I have picked the right guy this is a (laughs) what a speech and it's just two lines in this whole show and they're just like yep Vince you can have you you have it it's yours Vince if I could give you an Oscar right now I would like that's essentially what Ari does I want to go back to what you started off by saying, which is that you're absolutely right in that every single person gets what they want in this episode. Ari's been trying to get Vince back as a client. At the end of the episode, Vince agrees to come in and sign the papers. True. I forgot about Ari, too. And Lloyd, I guess, because Lloyd, Johnny's Lloyd's first client. Yes. 
Yeah. D- drama has just been like, you know, a has been, you know, freeloader for three and a half seasons. And this is the episode that solidifies them. So this is a, a pretty monumentous episode. Momentous. Is that the word I'm looking for? Uh, no, monumental, I think, is what Mon- you Thank you. That's yeah. was a combination of both. I'm a writer <laughs> yeah. and my I'm a writer <laughs> full time and I couldn't do that one. Um, A monumental episode for for everyone in the entourage. And uh, you're right. There's a little bit of like, well, this was a little too easy for everybody. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And it just is so like, and and that's just it. And maybe every episode of Entourage is like this. I don't know. But I just, and who knows? Like I said, maybe I just came in at exactly the right time where it's like the sort of climax of a bunch of stories all at once. But it seems to me like this is sort of the vibe. Just every episode is everybody gets everything they want and then it's over. Well, especially in these early seasons, that is more times than not the case. But it's still fun. Hey, it's still fun to talk about, right? Of course, and fun <laughs> to watch. I mean, I, rem- yeah. I mean, it's easy to watch when everybody's getting wins all the time and everyone on the show is hot. You're like, well, this is great. It's like eating popcorn. You just like keep yeah. popping like more episodes in your mouth. So, a couple of my quotes: Turtle to Rufus. I'm one of the good guys, Rufus. All right, you should know that. Okay, I'm loyal. I work hard. Kinda. And I respect the father-daughter bond. That's why I'm asking you. It's more like pleading with you. All right, please, just give me permission to take out your daughter. I liked Turtle, like, just fully admitting that he's, like, kind of a hard worker. He's, like, he knows what he appears as to, to this Rufus guy. Like, I also think it's weird that Turtle multiple times references how Rufus is a good dad. Yeah. Like, I've <laughs> never tried to pick up a woman by telling her dad how great of a job he did raising her. Like, That's one weird, of the, yeah. One of the lines Turtle has is, like, Rufus, you've done a great job with the shop and your daughter. <laughs> it's like, what? What? Hey, this car has got a really nice trunk. So does your daughter that you did a good job <laughs> Yeah. It's so weird. I'm it usually weird. like nervous meeting my girlfriend's father. I never yeah. would think to be like, you know, you did a really good job here. <laughs> There's no way to not make that sound so creepy. Woo! That's beautiful. You did a great job, Rufus. Yeah. What's your daughter, too? Goodbye, turtle. Bye, Two quick Johnny drama lines, then we'll move on. Drama goes, as they're walking into Ari's office, he goes, If that isn't a sign, I don't know what it is. A sign of what? A sign that my show is going down in flames. Oh, I don't get crazy. A bird kills itself just to destroy my ex, and I'm getting crazy? God, I don't need another failure. Made me laugh pretty hard because he's just so superstitious, and just the fact that a bird flies through the window in the opening scene is... I mean, it's absurd, but it's hilarious. Like, of course, if that happened to me on the biggest day of my life, I'd be like, I am done for. Oh, for sure. And I do think that, again, we see the entourage writing team here. Like, I feel like they're like, yeah, this is some like Shakespearean level yep. foreshadowing we're going <laughs> for. They're like, how can how can we really spike up the drama in this opening scene? Yep. Like, I know a bird flies through the window and crashes into their breakfast. Does that ever happen? Has a bird ever broken a no, window in your house? <laughs> never. Not one time. And certainly nope. it, 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 and it didn't land in my breakfast. Yeah. <laughs> Very coincidental. And then I could have put this as my favorite moment, and it's just got to be said. Just drama at the Grand Canyon dropping to his knees as White Room by Cream starts playing, and he just is like... Thank you, God. Victory! John, even us cynical comedians it made me smile man i just was like this is great i love seeing this guy like win one you know like he did shit on every episode it was just it was great to see i feel like drama was one of those guys i I actually might have tweeted this maybe it was at you when we were talking about doing this podcast i don't remember but i feel like in the beginning of the show you really cheer for e and you hate drama and i feel like by the end of the show their roles like totally reverse e be th- like they run out of ideas for e by like around this season so mm-hmm. e doesn't really have any meaningful story f- story arcs after this aside from like his relationship with sloan kind of and then like that's about it like he do- they kind of just it's like 
in the beginning, he's like struggling because he's like trying to be Vince's manager, but he's never done it before. He doesn't know what he's doing. Yeah. And then he and then he just like, oh, he figures it out and it's all good. And now now they're the best. And then drama, it's kind of in the beginning. You're like, oh, this guy's so annoying. Like he's just never getting wins. He's not annoying. He's just that he's a bad actor. You think he's never. And then he starts to change and he starts to get wins and his character develops more. And they like switch places by the end. You're like, e, shut the fuck up. Drama. <laughs> I want more of this. Yeah. Yeah. He's like the audience avatar early in the show. I've talked about this before on the pod. And then this is like the jumping off point for the next four seasons for drama. He's on this show on Five Towns for a very long time. I don't think he dits off the show and goes through all that, you know, uh, drama, for lack of a better word, until <laughs> midway through season six. So, right. What was your favorite burn from the Sweets episode? Oh, man, I loved it. Uh, uh, this is when uh, Johnny is Johnny goes into Ari's office in the morning and he's mad about uh, he's mad about the potential negative reviews of five towns. He doesn't know that they're what's going to happen yet. And Ari goes uh, drama. It's NBC. They gave Joey 46 episodes. They don't cancel shit. Trust me. Movie star, the manager in the big office. <laughs> It's kind of a burn on like everything that's going on in that moment, right? It's like yeah. your show, even if it sucks, it'll bit you know, we're gonna take a shot at Joey, we're gonna take a shot at NBC. It was great. It's an it's an Ari classic to me. Yeah, I, I loved it. That that was that got a legit pop from me. We mentioned it at the top, the boys, they're sitting in the kitchen. Turtles like, I'm hungry. Vince is going, Me too. Turtle goes, You want me to try to make us something? He goes, Yeah, I'm not that hungry. And then later E says the exact same thing, just basically implying that uh Turtle's a yep. terrible cook. Turtle doesn't work that hard. We've established. <laughs> we have established. So the last couple episodes, John, and I know you haven't been watching or listening, which is totally fine. The music has really been lacking in um okay. the episode. And uh, we talked every week about the music selection on the show and how good it is and our favorite songs. I think this episode has started to come back a little bit. Um, any songs in particular jump out at you as being particularly good? Yeah, I liked the one. So Turtle gets the car for the first time, and he's like about to pull it out of the driveway and close the door by Teddy Pendergrass starts playing. Yep. And uh, it's just like it's a small snippet of the song, but it just totally fits the mood of the scene. Like I'm driving this slick car. It's like a nice, and he's closed the door. The, you know, the, the chapter of the car is closed. The car door itself is closed. There's like maybe a layered meaning with the title of the song and then you hear about four seconds of it and he crashes into the <laughs> other car because he's looking at Kelly in the side view mirror. Yeah, that's really good. I um, I didn't actually write that one down. That's a, that's a, that's a nice call. I liked uh, every week Scott Venner, the music producer. I feel like almost every other week he puts a door song in there. Mm -hmm. And uh, when drama is driving through the night and crying his eyes out in his very well-lit Lincoln, when the music's over by the doors is playing, which was great. Very, like, overdramatic and, uh, uh, and obnoxious, but still very funny to me. That's Entourage. You just summarized the whole show right there. Overdramatic, but very funny to me. Yeah. <laughs> yep. And then uh, White Room by Cream at the end credits, which was which was great. I mean, they always end on these, like, I, I think it was just my desk last week who said, like, the closing song is, like, always batting a thousand. Like, no matter what, I never left an Entourage episode being like, well, that was only okay. The song always takes me out on a high note, and um, it, this one did the same. And I can remember, too, when I watched this show was around the time when I was starting to get more into, like, indie music and stuff like that. And I can remember, like, a couple times being, like, excited to hear a band I liked that maybe people didn't know in the end credits of, like, whoa, yeah. they got the end credits of Entourage. Like, I remember Kings of Leon was yep. one. Very they early were, they, Kings they of weren't Leon. That, yeah, they weren't that big at the time. Um, so, yeah, so to me, like, I was, a, I was an early Kings of Leon adopter, so I saw that, and then I was just like, hell yeah, that's my boys getting on Entourage, you know, and like, <laughs> additionally, like, fire you up. Uh, but, yeah, you're totally right. I, I do remember the, the end credit music always being very strong. That's that HBO budget, you know. 100%. And as everyone who's listening knows, we have a Spotify playlist with all the songs me and John just discussed. It's in the show notes of today's episode. Excellent. There you go. Wow. That's a really nice service for your listeners. Yeah. You know, I can't play the songs on the pod. <laughs> so <Right>. Fair enough. <laughs> so you're, you're covering your tracks. Yes, exactly. So uh, no celebrity cameos this week. Kind of a bummer. Let's, nice. uh, let's move on to just like... This is kind of like three or four categories in one, but like what appeared outdated to you? Any any lines, any moments, any references jump out at you? Okay. You mentioned the, the Joey one. 
Yes. Yeah, so I, ha- I had two aside from the Joey one. Uh, the first one is that Kelly is supposed to be seen as this like very hot, desirable woman who also has her finger on the pulse of the streets, you know, because she knows <laughs> everything about sneakers and she is dressed head to toe in rock aware. Yep. <laughs> uh, so that is definitely an outdated kind of thing. Like, oh, geez. Yeah. Was that. And I'm, I'm sure in 2007 you would have been like, OK, yeah, she's fly. But yeah, I, I don't think I've seen rock aware in maybe since that episode aired. <laughs> maybe that was the last time I saw rock aware in the wild. I don't think I've heard someone use the word fly since 2007. So <laughs> well, I'm just work. trying to I'm trying to get in the mindset here, JR. <laughs> that's all. Um, and then the other one was, this is like a double whammy because it's not only an outdated reference, but it makes no sense at all. Uh, and that's when, uh, Ari is talking about, uh, Matterhorn and he's trying to sell, he's trying to sell Vince on Matterhorn by, cause Vince says, you know, we read this script already. We didn't like it. I'm not going to be in Matterhorn. And so it's weird that Ari's trying to convince him that it's okay now. Cause it's been changed a lot. Like that seems like a weird like that doesn't seem like a selling feature to me like yeah. if the script is so bad that it's been changed a lot that doesn't seem that good but he says uh, the line he says is uh i know that's the thing the script has been changed more times than andy dick's vibrator you will love it now vince trust me it doesn't make any sense it I makes thought of no that too. sense because like i guess you could the what would make sense is if, if you said the batteries in yep. andy dick's vibrator yep. i think the script has changed more than the batteries in andy dick's vibrator but then even then like is that supposed to be i guess it's supposed to be like a homophobic joke that like yeah he's, like, like he he's uses using his vibrator vi- on himself so often like yeah like that's got to be it right so that's kind of weird and then just also like i mean yeah obviously referencing andy dick is hilarious and then yeah just he changes his vibrator like that i mean if you yeah, like and that's not even an insult to me like no. if a girl was like or a guy who's like, oh, yeah, like I, I just love vibrators and I buy a new one like once a month. I'd be like, oh, great. Yeah, cool. good for like, you. Yeah, that's awesome. You're, ex- you're exploring. It doesn't. Yeah. So it's just such a weird like t- it was a double whammy of an outdated reference that also <laughs> made no sense as a joke. The last one that I just had to call out was that the Five Towns premiere debuted to 16 million viewers, which was tops in the coveted 18 to 49 demo. If a show in 2019, we'll talk about the 2019 stuff right now, (laughs) debuted to 16 million viewers, it would be the number one show of the decade. Yeah, because wasn't the Game of Thrones series finale like 18 or 19 million or something like that? I've got it written right here. That is the one reference point I have today. The Game of Thrones series finale drew 13 and a half million viewers for the initial airing of the finale. And after repeat airing, that number climbed to 19 million. So there we go. But still, the context of that is staggering. Back in 2007, 16 million viewers would have just tuned into this random NBC drama that just debuted. And today you can't even get three quarters of that. <laughs> yeah, it was definitely funny. Uh, and I, I wrote that down in my uh, in the like, how would this episode be different in 2019 of just like, it would be something like, oh, five towns was downloaded on Netflix, like the, the, the X number of times or watched on Netflix, like at X number of times. Netflix would release the streaming numbers like a yeah. week after the fact, and that would be how they like it renewed on Netflix or something. So yeah, how would this episode be different in 2019? Besides that, anything else? Yeah, so I got that. I also, I mean, it is very funny to me that sometimes Entourage mirrors real life. Yeah. Um, so there's the obvious, you've probably talked about it before, there's the obvious Narcos tie-in, yep. um, that Medellin is essentially Narcos. Uh, <laughs> like, I don't know if someone at Netflix, or I guess Narcos is HBO, isn't it? So I don't Narcos know. Narcos is Netflix, actually. Oh, it is Netflix. Okay, That's yeah. Right, so yeah. <laughs> someone was watching Entourage, yeah. and they're like, we should make Medellin. <laughs> <laughs> this Dud Allen guy's yeah, got a great idea. And Aquaman really too. And Ferrari. <laughs> Just totally. And that was the other thing I said is that I, I felt like uh, if this were in 2019, the movie that Vince would be offered in exchange for Medellin would have been like an obscure superhero. Yeah. So it would have been like, which is funny that, again, Vince does become Aquaman or whatever, but this would be like almost like a, a Doctor Strange equivalent or just yeah. kind of like a, you know, like a C-level superhero that, you know, Doug, uh, that's his name, right? Doug would be like, 
would say, you know, oh, this was my favorite superhero growing up as a kid, but no one thinks it's a viable property, but I really want to make it a movie because he's my favorite superhero. Yeah. I know. So to me, that was the 2019. That would be the trade off is Vince would have to play, you know, and then E would be like, ah, oh, we're not playing some fucking C level superhero. <laughs> I've never even heard of this fucking superhero. <laughs> you know, blah, blah, you know, that yeah. would be, they'd have some kind of pithy comeback for how lame the superhero is, you know? Yeah. Uh, Doctor Strange, more like fuck you. you know? <laughs> Doctor Gay, yeah, that's what they yeah, would do. <laughs> you're right, you're right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I wanted to talk a little bit about that, and we're going all over the place, which is the best part of this podcast. But sure. let's be honest here. At one point, the only option Vince has is to do Matterhorn, and then he will get to do Median. Not even if I were to tell you that Joe Roberts said if you do Matterhorn for him, he will do Median for you. Really? Really. What's the catch? There is no catch. Which one goes first? That's the catch. No, thank you, Ari. Vince. Ari, no, no, no. Vince, Vince, Vince. This is a good goddamn project. I've been saying this to you since day one. Why can't you just be reasonable? Why can't you be reasonable and understand that I don't care if Matterhorn is the best project in the history of movies? I want Medellin. I've wanted it for two fucking years. So until someone tells me that that will never happen, that is the only thing I want to do. Why doesn't he do that? What, like, actor in their right mind is like, oh, wait, I gotta do something else first? No. Like, oh, wait, you're gonna pay me $4 million to do that movie before you pay me $5 million to do the other movie? Like, it does, it blows my mind. Because he seems to think that, like, oh, no, I'm gonna get hoodwinked. I'm gonna not be able to do Medellin. Like, there's such a thing as a contract that Ari would draw up that would, like, hopefully yeah. make that, that airtight. I don't know. What did you think to that? Well, I think I agree with you. Like, I think that that was the implication, you know, because yeah, Vin, Vince kind of has the whole thing of like, well, this is a this is a crazy town. You know, anything can happen here in Hollywood. I'm just a boy from Queens and everyone here just fucks everybody else over. <laughs> and so that's definitely the implication is that he would do Matterhorn and then Joe. Sorry, I called him Doug. Joe would find a way. Oh, to, got it. Doug's yeah, the yeah. creator of Entourage. Sorry, I yes. was thinking of Joe, the movie. Joe, Joe Roberts. Roberts. Yep. Yeah. Joe would like have a way of like scheming him out of yeah. getting to do Medellin. But yes, I agree with you. Like it doesn't there that that happens a lot in Entourage where it, it seems to be this thing where Vince is like, oh, I have to got to up my cred. You know, yeah. I, I can't be doing these big movies because I got to keep my my cred, my clout up. But it just is like, I don't know. Yeah, it's hard to buy Vince as like a serious artist when like the main thing he wants in the season finale of season one is a phone call from Scarlett yeah. Johansson. And then we're supposed to pretend like two seasons later that he absolutely will not do another movie until he does this three hour art house epic about a Colombian drug lord. Like it just is such a weird, you know, it's like a very yeah. strange kind of trade off there. Um, but yeah, it makes sense that he would just do both. Also, we could talk about how the fact that the the script that no one wants to make costs five million dollars. <laughs> Have you ever heard of a script costing that much money in your life? Even like, now, even now, a script like that would be like one point two. Like it yeah. honestly would be a lot. And then and, and, and how it works now is I'm not super familiar with the Hollywood thing, but from what I understand is you get the option to buy the script. You basically own the rights to the script as opposed to the script, right? Uh, do you have any insight into that? Yeah, I don't, but I <laughs> <laughs> but here's my here's my educated guess. Yeah, is it like I I do think you're exactly right. It's like Joe would would buy the rights, which would piss off Vince, but there's no way that the rights to make the movie would cost five million. That just doesn't <laughs> that just doesn't exist. They're just yeah. And Vince is like, yeah, I'll bankrupt myself to make this movie. It's like yep. that. This, especially the fact that they go to such great lengths to say that it's in purgatory, that it's like in script purgatory, and no one will make it. And then, and then now all of a sudden, it's like the most valuable project in Hollywood that I've ever heard of in my life. I mean, I just yeah. don't think so. I wanted to call out one Twitch faces in the crowd. Every week we kind of like point out an actor or an actress in the background and, and uh, explore their background. I want to talk about Rufus's daughter, Kelly. Okay, yeah, because I didn't know. I, 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 lo I looked for faces in the crowd and I didn't see any. So this is good that you got this covered. She's played by actress and model Lauren London. 
she initially started her career as making appearances in numerous music videos for artists such as Ludacris, Pharrell, and Snoop Dogg. Cool. She had a breakout role in 2006 when she was playing uh, T.I.'s romantic lead in the film ATL, which she was nominated for Best Supporting Actress at the uh, BET uh, Movie Awards that year for. However, it's her personal life that's the more interesting. So okay. she was the most famous on again, off again girlfriend of uh, Little Wayne. Oh, okay. She has a son with him. For four years, Little Wayne had Lauren tattooed on his right arm, but when they broke up, he tattooed the word Carter over it. And most recently, uh, in 2013, she began dating rapper Nipsey Hussle. Um, oh. Until he unfortunately died earlier this year on March 31st. She also has a son with him. So... A fixture in the hip-hop community, a baby mama for some pretty well-established hip-hop artists. Yeah, so that so she was with Dipsy Hustle like when he was killed. Uh, it looks like it, sadly. Wow, crazy. That's wild. And she's well, got a three-year-old son by him, so. Shout out to Lauren London. If you're yeah. listening to the show, yeah. uh, you, you did good. <laughs> great job, Lauren. Yeah, and great job, Rufus, for raising her. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on to Johnny Drama. So let's let's dive in. What was your favorite drama moment from this so episode? So I'm actually thrilled that you did not say, because you've had a couple drama quotes so far, yep. and you didn't say the quote that I thought was the funniest. And I I will say, Kevin Dillon, is yes. just a, he's just a delight. He's just, he's so fun to watch in this show. And he's like the reason I would rewatch the whole thing, I think. is like, he just has so many good moments. He really nailed this character. Um, like of all the characters, I think he's the one that you can, when you rewatch it, you're like, oh, he has like a clearly defined character that he's playing. Like all the rest of them, like we said, they kind of, you know, they have the, the characters kind of switch and they're doing different things. And, and they're also just kind of like nondescript, like unfortunately for the actors, like, you know, Vince is just a famous yeah. actor and he's just a manager. And, you know, Johnny has this like arc of like, he's been beaten down by the industry so many times and he's this like kind of foil for Vince and and Kevin Dillon just plays it so good. But there's a great moment when uh, when drama comes home from the variety incident and he's got all the newspapers and he's seen all the reviews that say he's really shitty and Vince feels bad for him. And so Vince says, the hell is that? It's Turtle. He's got something that'll cheer you up. A gun? Come on, drama. You're going to love this. I swear. <laughs> It's good. It's great TV writing, and it's a, it's an yeah. incredible performance by Tevin Dillon. Totally, and that's the thing with Entourage is like I don't think that there are a ton of funny lines, but that was one. Like I, I, I shouldn't I should rephrase. There are funny lines, but in this show, you're often beat over the head with them because they're usually delivered by Ari. Yep, and it's they're usually very obvious. Like subtle comedy was not the strong suit of entourage I think we sure. can all agree so sure. when a joke like this hits or it's just kind of like an under the radar it immediately as soon as he says a gun it immediately like quick cuts yep. to them being outside with the car like it's just left there it's a perfect subtle joke and it totally fits drama's character and it just like yeah that that got a genuine laugh out loud yep. moment from me in within that same like you know three minute area I liked when they're going over the reviews at the kitchen table and drama goes at the post yeah. What does it say? Fuck this stuff, drama. Not my hometown paper. <clears throat> no wonder mom hasn't called me today. I mean, it's a perfect character trait that, like, Mrs. Chase has to call Johnny every single day to check in on him. And the idea that he would be offended by his hometown paper. Yeah. I really yeah. liked that, too. Just how can my how can my own hometown paper do this to me? You know, <laughs> like like he he's more it seems like he's more mad about that than like the variety or like the papers that people are actually reading. It's like the Queen's Bulletin or whatever. Yep. And yep. My Queen's own Bulletin. <laughs> my own hometown paper. How could they do this to me? <laughs> Um, and then really quick, we don't have to talk about the Rub and Todd scene that much, but just the fact that he's just so familiar with everyone and he's just such a regular, he's like, hey, Maxie, what's the haps? And then as he's walking out, the guy goes, what's up, Drama? And he goes, hey, Lenny. But he just knows everyone. <laughs> yeah. I also like that in the, op in the first scene when he walks in there, 
the first time he walks in there, like every guy in there is kind of like hiding themselves. Yep. Like the camera's like a hidden camera expose. Like you see a guy like putting on a hat and sunglasses as he's like walking out the door and another guy's kind of like shielding his face from drama and drama sure. just walks in like, hey, Ruthie. Uh, <laughs> oh, is uh, what? Kimberly's not in today? Yeah. What the hell? Oh, man. Oh, I miss her when she's gone. You know, oh, this sucks. Like, you know, he doesn't care at all. Everyone else is supposedly very embarrassed to be in this rub and tug. And Johnny's like selecting his masseuse. Yeah, he's asking he for everything. his favorite waitress at a, like a <laughs> diner. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, there he is, the bigger TV star. Hey, Maxie, what's the haps? You are. You're the talk of the whole shop. Hope your show don't get canceled because everyone get real depressed around here. Yeah, well, anyway, will you please tell Ruthie I'm here? And I'm in need. Oh, man. So, every week we talked about who won the episode. But Vince is exempt from this tatador. He wins every week. He's the A-list movie star. Who besides Vince won this week's episode of Entourage, John? I mean, I think we all... Drama won this episode, yeah. for sure. Yep. You know, he it's been a three-season arc. And he also has something to fight for, you know? It's like, yeah, Turtle gets a win in this show, yeah. but, it's, but it's like, it's minor, you know? It's like turtles wins are getting a date with a hot girl like that's not i mean turtles life is pretty uncomplicated and like for john for johnny to have been fighting against the hollywood machine for years and then to finally get his moment albeit tarnished a little bit by the reviews and stuff uh yeah it's drama for me i completely agree with you he's finally finally a tv star back where he's always wanted to be where he's talked about episode over episode which he's referenced I mean, it's it's great to see, and uh, yeah, it really kind of changes the arc of the character, which I'm looking forward to diving into over the next uh, year worth of Entourage <laughs> episodes. God bless you. <laughs> John, was this an A-list episode, a B-list episode, or a D-list episode? All right, so I'm going to say, I feel like, pardon me, in the context of the show, it's probably an A-list episode, only in the fact that it sets the table for a lot sure. of the future episodes, but for me... I'm going to actually cop out and say it's a C list. Ooh, okay. I don't I don't think to me it wasn't strong enough to be a B list, but it wasn't weak enough to be a D list. So I'm just inventing my own category no, here that's and great. I'm saying like Johnny Drama, it is a C list <laughs> episode. Uh it just cuz yeah, it had a couple good jokes. Obviously, it does do a lot of like moving the plot forward, but it's just the stakes are so low and the wish fulfillment is so high that it was just like <laughs> I'm interested to see what you think about it because you've actually watched however many sure. episodes came before this. I'm interested to see where you think it slots in the canon because just for me, uh, as a one-off shoot, it, it was a C. Well, first off, thank you for referring to it as canon because I've readily referred to it as like a, a sacred text entourage, <laughs> which is one of the most absurd things that's ever happened to my life. I just have to call that out. Um, so I, I agree with the first thing you said, which is like, there is a lot of pieces moving around the board. And when we look back on the last two, three episodes, nothing has happened. The last two, three episodes, Vince is banning his agent. Ari is like out on his ass as Vince's agent and like trying to get him back and kind of like stuck in these weird side plots. And nothing is really happening. They're just like hanging out, kind of stuck in the mud. So this episode definitely propels the plot forward and sets the table for the next season to two seasons of the show, which I really liked. So for that reason, I'm giving it a B. However, I'm giving it a B minus, if that's even possible, because there is no iconic celebrity cameo. There's no like great location that they're all on, which like sometimes really, you know, vaults an entourage episode into like, you know, top 10 status. So you're like me, you almost wanted to make it a C list, but yeah. because you made the categories, you couldn't disparage your own category making. <laughs> I I can do that. I'm a guest. I can be 100%. Like, I'm making my own list, but you're you... like an editor. You can just edit whatever you want. <laughs> yeah. But you're like, no, like I guess within a B list, it's like a B minus. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, sure. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay. So I'm good. I'm glad we were on the same page on that because I wasn't too sure. Me too. So John, last question I asked of all my first time guests, who are you? In your own real life entourage. Oh boy. Here are you ready for this cop out answer I'm about to throw down? If you if you give me E, I'm gonna be like, cool, you and everyone else. Uh no, I'm not E. Uh I'm not uh an annoying uh piece of shit. Uh <laughs> so no, I'm just joking. Uh, I, I actually liked E for most of the uh, most of the run of the show. I felt like I identified with E, even sure. though I didn't feel like I was E. I just felt like I identified with him. Uh so th this is a twofold answer. So first of all, I would say 
I'm Vince only in looks, and that's <gasps> not saying that's not saying I'm good looking. I'm wow. it just in. I'm I'll, I'm going to send you a picture, Jr. And you can put this up on the show blog. When when Entourage came out, people used to tell me I looked like him. I had exactly the same haircut. Oh, I have wow. Thick, I have thick eyebrows. I have like a near beard. So I actually worked in a warehouse when Entourage was out, and they used to call me Vinny in the warehouse wow. because they thought I. And now. This I realize this sounds bad because Adrian Grenier is basically acknowledged as being like an extremely attractive sure, man. Sure, sure. So I'm I'm like the D list Adrian <laughs> Grenier. Okay, so I, I cannot just, wait to see this, and I cannot wait for all the Instagram followers at Oh Yeah Pod <laughs> to check it out right now. Hopefully, it's up okay. by now. I will, I will, I will send you the picture, and you Thank can you. judge for you can judge for yourself. Amazing. But yes, so that's it. I don't identify with the character. Uh, okay. Character wise, I identify it with drama. That's great. Uh, not that I've really been, you know, I'm a stand-up comedian. I've been doing it for almost 10 years. And it's not that I've really been kicked by the industry. I've had a very, I've had a very lucky and a very good career thus far. But doing comedy in Canada does sometimes feel like you're just constantly banging your head against the wall <laughs> because our, uh, our nation makes one new comedy show a year. Uh, <laughs> so about five people get jobs in comedy every year. Yeah. Uh, and it's very difficult to work in the United States where the opportunities are. Um, so it's just, yeah, it's one of those things where I identify with drama from that side of it, of just kind of like, okay, I fe- I'm lucky. I feel very successful and I feel like I've had some great moments in my life, which I'm sure drama would also acknowledge, but it would be nice if, if, uh, you know, it, things went a little better for me sometimes. No, that's fantastic. That's the first Vince drama hybrid answer we've ever gotten. I've gotten hybrids of a lot of people, but that's the first Vince and drama. So oh. congratulations. Thank you. Wow, I feel... <laughs> do I get something? No, um, no. You get to... <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> John, this has been so much fun. Thank oh, you thank for you. going super deep on this episode. You're a great guest. You have great opinions about the show, which I always love. Thank um, you. I appreciate it, man. Thank you for having where me. Where can the Oh Yeah listeners find you, follow you, and come to some of your shows? Oh, great. Yeah. So I am, uh, as you mentioned off the top, I do a podcast called Blocked Party. Uh, it's me and Stefan Heck, who you might recognize yeah. from the internet. He's at boring as heck. Oh, he's hilarious. Um, yeah. Very good at Twitter. Uh, we have a podcast, like I said, called Blocked Party, where we have a guest on every week to talk about a time they were blocked on social media uh <laughs> and it's uh it's a blast so uh, we'll have to have you on jr it's oh, uh, be great. it's a great show and uh people like it so you can you can follow that on twitter at blocked party pod uh and i also have a new metal podcast so it's kind of in the vein of this it's like going back and looking at something that was maybe a little bit maligned but looking at it with some fresh eyes uh so it's me and brian quinby from street fight radio uh we we have a new metal podcast called the pod cast uh and that's pod cast with a k and you can check that out on twitter at the pod underscore cast with a k and you can check out me at cullen the comic and that's where all my shows are and i got a link to my album there and everything like that I will put links in the show notes for all of that, your podcast, your current podcast, your new podcast, and uh, all your socials. It's in the show notes of today's episode, guys. I am losing my voice. This has been a lot of fun, John. (laughs) Have a great rest of your week, guys. And uh, John, thanks for joining. Thanks, JR. Thanks to everyone for listening. And I hope you enjoyed future episodes of Entourage. (laughs) And oh, yeah. (laughs) 